Now, look, at any point, guys, feel free to chirp in, throw some comments, throw some uh, questions, whatever you want, and we can work through it in a more of a discussion sense rather than us sitting here presenting to you guys for an hour. We prefer a discussion. We prefer a smaller workshop. So this is, this is a great opportunity for us to have that chat. Let's talk, let's talk quickly about, about the context and things that we'd like to cover. Obviously, Dave and I put a bit of a military spin on things, but there's some, there's some things that we really need to draw out. And it's some of those um, unknowns within strategy and within people themselves that come to the forefront. So we're talking about types of people in strategy and we talk about offensive and defensive. We all have an internal bias towards, um, you know, either a move toward or a move away. Some of us like to move toward risk, some like to move away from risk. And you know, let's not confuse offensive and defensive strategy for the military style, hey, we're attacking something, or you know, that, that sort of um, military connotation. When we're talking about uh, an offensive strategy, we're looking at opportunities, gaining momentum, um, finding gaps, you know, using resources to find those opportunities and prosecute those opportunities and actually look for new gaps. When we're talking about the defensive side of the house, we're looking at protecting staff retention, you know, cost saving and risk mitigation, those types of things. Just quickly on the move away and the move, uh, move toward, move toward risk, right? When we talk about setting, it's making sure we've got the conditions set to actually allow those people that are naturally uh, move toward and naturally orientate towards risk, setting the conditions for them to do that safely without overextending. When we're talking about those defensive style people, the move away, it's understanding that they come from a position of protection for the company, right? They actually want what's best for the company, but their way of, of presenting that is in a, is in a hay and we need to protect our vulnerabilities. So we have to find a happy medium and the balance between those. Um, they, they're not mutually exclusive. Okay, so offensive strategies and defensive strategies aren't mutually ex exclusive and they usually happen concurrently. So we allocate a uh, portion of our business in the defensive to protect our weaknesses, protect our vulnerabilities, and, you know, um, consolidate prior to launching onto an offensive or uh, identifying gaps and opportunities. So um, they're not mutually exclusive and it's a point that will come out a little bit later on. And what we'll discuss a little bit later as well is what identifies the point in which we transition from an offensive to a defensive or a defensive to an offensive and the key parts within leadership about making those decisions and identifying those tr tr triggers which enable us to switch. So that's the context for today's session. Dave. Cheers. So in the, has anyone got any questions about the, the, previous, the previous points? We'll, we'll pull them apart in a little bit more detail as we keep moving forward. No, this is, this is pretty clear. Okay, let's do it. So, you know, not surprising, our strategies are normally geared towards people and people behaviours. Um, you know, John has briefly touched on the move away, uh, risk reduction type of person. Uh, they normally create about a 50-50 split between move away and move towards kind of people. I guess the, pe the key point in all this is, Every human and therefore every team, because of uh, a proxy of its leadership, has a bias towards uh, a certain type of decision making. Um, and, you know, in, in the last couple of decades, we've seen um, great analysis and study into the way people um, have bias and the effects that it actually has on various aspects of society and also our organisations and teams. The reason why we mention it is in many ways, until we really understand those biases, we don't know which way we're geared and therefore we don't know the influences that are affecting our decision making and then our subsequent choices. So um, as we go through this session, we'll start pulling that apart in a little bit more detail each bit, but I'd love you to have the context of why we're approaching it in that way. Um, you, know, a command, you know, back in the day, a commander that knew um, that they were quite a risk averse individual would generally surround themselves by people who were opportunity or gap finders. Um, and um, by the same right, the, the opposite might occur where you might have a very aggressive and a very um, forward leaning, um, you know, boss or leader, and they might surround themselves with the right balance of risk reducing people in order to find the right mix for the strategy that they're actually going to roll out. 
Now that leads on to the fourth point, which is knowing your gaps and plugging them. So there's a level of assumption here that we have um, some level of self-awareness about our own decision-making and our own biases and therefore um, what implications that will have on our decision-making for our teams, um, but moreover for our strategy. A case of this might look like if you have um, an organization where everyone in the, in the room when they first built the strategy five years ago um, was a forward leaning, highly aggressive um, carbon copy of each other because they were all hired in the same way by the same type of person. And suddenly that team is diluted or changed over time. Then what you'll see is a mismatch of delivery um, and approach from the actual team that is going to roll out that effect. Moreover, you might have a cascade of leadership where you have a, um, you know, a risk averse leader, but we might have forward leaning people underneath that just see them as an obstructionist. And understanding this from the onset is how we work around it, but also, I guess, understanding it is 90% of that battle. Thanks, John. So when we talk about move away, move away people and those that like to look at risk mitigation, I'll, I'll front load everyone straight away. The way Dave and I um, are an interesting team because Dave is naturally moved towards and I'm move away. But the context is slightly different. When I look at defense and I look at mitigating strategies and risk, it's always from a position of setting the conditions to um, move toward. And Dave is exactly the same. When he looks at gap finding and creating opportunities and those sort of things, it's always so that you can find the gap, open it, then I can come in, consolidate, rebuild, protect, so that we can then step forward again. It, it's very military in its manner, but it's also um, very deliberate. And we both are self-aware enough to understand where we fit in the scheme and we can switch and change at any stage. But my natural bias is to move away. Dave's natural bias is move towards. So when we're talking from a, a position of knowledge, there's some information from us to you about you know, who we are and the type of people we are. When I talk about risk management, it's not from a position of obstruction. Okay. We're talking about managing risk in order to consolidate to set the conditions to move forward again. Look, we'll have arguments and disagreements and that's just the way it is, but it comes from a position of protecting the organization and trying to move the organization forward. You know, we've discussed and we've built a strategy for the organization and we understand where our different skill sets fit within that strategy. Okay, so what does that, what does that look like? You know, how does, how does a move away person and how do their behaviors manifest within an organization? Well, it's simple. They're the people that look at workplace health and safety in order to mitigate um, physical liabilities. They look at cost reduction strategies so they're not overextending on expenditure and operating costs. They look at retention of staff rather than looking at new staff to bring on because they understand their costs associated with retraining, reskilling, rehiring. You know, they're looking at, at um, consolidating those assets that they have on hand in order to best set the conditions to move forward. Why, why is it important? Um, happy to throw this one out there if anyone wants to comment. Why, why do you think risk mitigation is, is important? Does anyone have any comments on it? Yeah. Feel free I to chirp in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was thinking about this. You're resonating with me because I've had clients in the past who've had this problem and you're, you know, it's a consultant trying to navigate the landscape is, is difficult. So, I mean, it, it comes in different forms. It depends on where you are in the org. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's important from like, for instance, at a, at a low level in a project, right? If you're, if you're down there, then you don't want to, you don't want to lose people. Like, you know, yep. you just, I'm just your example from before, keep your attention, but, a, but at a higher level, um, you know, if you've got competitors that are able to come in and move faster than you and, and wipe you out in a heartbeat, right? Yep. You certainly want to be prepared. Yeah. No, oh, 100%. Right. Well, that's, a, that's a really good point. And you mentioned something that, you know, when you're talking about retaining people, a lot of people underestimate the cost associated with retaining corporate knowledge. Okay. People, people look at the bottom line. Take um, a lot of companies that are looking at COVID at the moment and, you know, they're looking at the bottom line. They're like, well, we need to ensure we've got enough operating capital to retain operations in long term. You know, some people aren't thinking about the long term strategy, which incorporates getting those people back or getting that corporate knowledge back and the cost of rehiring, cost of reskilling, 
and those sort of things. They just go, okay, yep, bottom line, operating cost, cut. Um, you know, there's obviously there's some organizations that have to think that way, but it's part of a long-term strategy. But there's some other people that are just looking at that bottom line and making decisions not in line with their strategy, but in line with the, the, the immediate target that's right in front of their face. And, you know, that's it's a very difficult position to be in. And it's one of those things that people need to, need to take into account. But we don't understand the costs of retention, corporate knowledge, and um, the rehiring, reskilling. So it's just a point to understand. There are some risks of a defensive strategy if it's not balanced with um, people that are forward leaning and, and move move toward orientated is stagnation. People get comfortable in a defensive scenario, like whether it's in a military context, in a defensive position, or whether it's in a stable environment within a business context, they get comfortable and they stagnate. And like, no, no, we're in defense. We're not looking for new opportunities. We're not looking for new gaps. We're comfortable. Um, Profit's okay. Everything is, you know, at the status quo. Everyone's comfortable. Everyone's happy. The risk of that is you don't identify and obtain those new opportunities. It could be even in staff. You know, we're happy with our staff. We're happy with the way our team's performing. We don't need any new people. But you might miss that one superstar or those that high-performing team member coming in, shaking things up enough to be able to prosecute new opportunities. Um, that is that is a key risk. When we get comfortable in a position right? And we're not looking at setting the conditions for the next phase or the next um, opportunity, we sh might struggle to regain that momentum. That momentum that got us to the point where we're at, where we're profitable, where we're, we've prosecuted great opportunities, we've implemented really good projects, our strategy is humming along and we're up to a five-year review and we can't regain momentum because everyone's just comfortable. They've stagnated and they're not, they don't want to look for new opportunities because they don't want to open themselves up to risk because everyone's happy and everyone's comfortable. Um, refocusing our staff. It's important because if people are comfortable in defense, you know, trying to get them to switch and change and move into an offensive strategy is very, very difficult. So there's a key point with leadership in here and expectation managing people on how long we're going to be in a defensive posture or whether we've apportioned a a piece of our organization to be in the defense and in the protective side and we've kept the um, offensive side separate still interlinked but that people are still looking for gaps understand that if you're when they're not mutually exclusive or when they're integrated that way there is a resource burn we need to understand that resource burn and be prepared to accept that again that's a that's a point of leadership and a point of strategy and planning um, there's another reason why we look at a defensive strategy right, is we've identified a gap, we've identified an opportunity, but we don't have the resources to prosecute that or to um, move forward and obtain that opportunity. So we go into a defensive posture to build up resources to consolidate so that we can then step that forward, right? That's it's very important. And it's a key part of the transition because if we launch into an offensive strategy or into a gap finding mentality before the consolidation, there's a chance of us overextending and putting ourselves at... Um, an unnecessary risk of overexposure uh, and that's setting the conditions for, for offensive strategy. Every, the, both strategies link and it's a savvy leader or a few leaders that understand how they integrate and how they link to then be able to make um, the most of both strategies at the same time. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I was just thinking of an example of what you were speaking about. Um, and one, you know, when you were talking about going into, I guess, a defensive posture in order to set the conditions for you to do the next jump forward. Yeah. Um, an example of that is you might have a perfect marketing campaign locked and loaded conceptually, but you might not have the technology. You might not have the, the, um, the lead list. You might not have the information or data that you need in order to confirm that the trigger is right to do the advance. So in that context, that might be the collection of resources. You might, yeah. you know, you might have this perfect technology, but if you move too soon, um, you know, what you deliver as a service might be underwhelming. Um, and then that can have flow on implications. Whereas if you had waited that extra two weeks or maybe that extra month um, and have locked in what that, that solution holistically looks like, um, you might have had an exponentially um, improved outcome from that. So that was where my head was at when Jono was speaking.
And that, that's a good point as well. Going into a defensive posture, you know, people look at it as if, you know, we're shelling up and we're just protecting ourselves for the period of time. What, when we talked earlier about concurrent activity, what a defensive posture, a defensive structure allows you to do is, it, sorry, it buys you time. It buys you time to plan your next stage. It protects your key assets and you consolidate so that you can make the most of the next opportunity and the next step as we, as we look to move forward. So again, positive and negatives of both, but they need to integrate. They need to be aware of both so that you, you can capitalize on the opportunities that that kind of time provides. And something um, just between what you were saying, Jonathan, and what Dave says a lot. And it's when you were mentioning that if you stay too long in a, in a defensive strategy, then you become stagnant. But yeah. it's, and it's also the, the people's mindset as well um, and how they become resistant to change because they are comfortable and they don't actually see, because they've been comfortable for so long, they don't see um, the, the pain and pleasure being weighted well enough to want to motivate them to change. And something that Dave says a lot that really helps to move people in that space is the what do you know? Yeah. Because when you're in that space, it's often actually an emotive that you're like, oh, I'm a bit scared and I'm a bit unsure and I'm a bit tentative rather than a factual. What are the statistical chances here of us putting this into effect and having a good outcome? And statistically, if the numbers are saying you've got a high, high chance of success here and we've got all the facts in to date, then we take the action rather than letting our emotions hold us yeah. back. Yeah, that's really smart. That's really, really smart, Dan. Um, you know, when we talk about obstructions to change, you know, more in a change management setting as well, fear of change is, is huge. As you've been comfortable and safe for so long, you know, the, the reminder of what it was like to, to prosecute an advantage or seize on an opportunity, you know, that, that excitement, that rush, people have forgotten that. And the benefit of that, and all they're thinking about is on, you know, oh no, we might, we might fail here. We're comfortable, we're safe, um, moving forward overexposes us. Well, it doesn't because you've looked at the stats, you've looked at the opportunity, you've done the analysis, and, you know, there's a really, really high um, likelihood of success. All right, we'll look at moving on. Yeah, you, you guys, you, you can apply this to, to building a team, right? So it's like, um, recently I've been focused a lot on upskilling my team, especially mm -hmm. since COVID. Um, and so what you're, what you're saying resonates really well because you're too stagnant, right? You lose your skills. Um, yep. if, you're, if you're too aggressive, you're going to bring in people who are all visionary and you're not going to have any, anybody who's going to be actioning on things. Um, so yeah. yeah, this is pretty awesome. Thanks, Ryan. So I guess the offset to, um, I guess the defensive posture is, is we're now looking at the, the forward leaning um, and the gap, what you know, we colloquially refer to as the gap finding mentality. Um, and the one thing I would say about this is, you know, and as John, I said, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit more of the gap finder in our team, um, but I would say I also play that role deliberately um, as a choice. You know, I can switch and change as required, but my part to play in the team is to be that gap finder. Um, and it's a choice as much as anything else. Um, the reason why I mentioned choice is, it, is it's very important to conceptualize and expectation manage for one's team. And to explain that context to the team to say, hey, look, we are making a deliberate choice to lean forward at this point. And in doing so, we acknowledge that these risks occur and these risks are okay. I, you know, I as the leader in my lane accept this level of risk, but I want people to be going out and autonomously finding gaps and opportunities, and I will not burn you if this goes wrong. Um, we are taking a risk in order to get a, a far improved gain from where we are at this point in time, um, but it is a deliberate choice and we understand the risks. And this is, this is the important relationship between you know, the move away and the move toward like and people is that a lot of the time they're operating in the same workspace, but they've never actually had this chat. They've never actually sat down and gone, hey, look, I, I, I want you to know that I'm actually a risk averse person. Um, so I will constantly be running it through these filters of sanity um, to make sure that I'm protecting the team as much as I can. Um, and that that's where I see my my space and my my responsibility in this group and the other person goes oh man I'll, I'll, if there's a gap i'll find it 
like, you know, and understanding that they're the roles that we're going to play so that we're not treading on each other's toes. But that all um, sits subordinate under an agreement of an overarching strategy that says overall, we're going to be trying, we're going to actually shift to be more forward leaning. So we've got, we've almost got two things at play simultaneously. We've got these interpersonal relationships and then we have a team acknowledgement of what our overall approach is going to be. It's no different to a sporting analogy. You know, when you enter the field and you're getting your ass handed to you and then you're like, no, we need to really lock this goal tight. So we're going to close up for a bit and so and so and so and so will be finding gaps, but we're not going to be doing that for about 10 minutes. We've got to wear out the team a little bit. Right. That's our strategy. Off we go. But you know, and some people might be able to relate to that analogy, but the same applies in the corporate sense. We've only got a finite amount of energy, which leads to point three, which is our understanding our limitations and our reach. One of the key risks for a forward leaning strategy is we overextend. We go too far. We overextend our brand. We start diluting our messaging. We start pushing too far that our resources can't reinforce our efforts and our overheads start to increase. An example of that might be um, marketing campaigns. You might want to push out five or six different service related marketing campaigns, but all of them have maybe a uh, monthly recurring cost on the back end of them for subscriptions for um, certain types of technology we're going to um, use and, and, you know, also um, third party organizations finding lists for us and all these sorts of things, each of those rack up simultaneously and we can overburn our resources um, and we might actually dilute the effect because we haven't, we haven't locked in what it is we're actually trying to achieve. There's another really, really key point in all of this is that Elite, you know, in the leadership space, we have to explain to our teams what the goal looks like when we've actually achieved it. If we've transitioned into um, an offensive uh, business strategy, we need to have taken the time to explain what it is that we're actually trying to achieve and how do we know we've hit it. So, you know, there's, you know, the, the wanky consultant buzzwords of KPIs and, you know, milestones and whatnot. But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be wanky consultant buzzwords. It can be an explanation that just says, we will know we've been successful when we've got 45 people subscribed to this marketing campaign. We've operated at this agreed budget. Um, we've professionally educated our team in levels of succession so we could repeat this process if we needed to do it again. We've mapped how we did this and what was successful and what wasn't. Maybe they are the four um, key success criteria for this particular campaign. And knowing that, that the person who's going to take the lead and autonomously run this beast goes, oh, I just hit 50 people. I'm about right on my budget. Um, you know, I think we're ready to go for launch, pressing launch on the event. Um, I'll go go back to, to the boss and the team and say, hey, look, I think we're ready to go. I think we've hit the criteria. It's as simple as that. It doesn't actually need to be too complicated. But a lot of the time, we'll go to our teams and just say, go. And they'll go. And in the absence of context, they'll rationalize their own and they'll just go run around doing God knows what. And, um, you know, ultimately, the organization bears the burn for that because they're paying for this hand over fist, let alone the internal cost for the salary of the person or the team. So just think about it through that lens. Ultimately, you know, leadership plays a very, very important part, particularly in a forward leaning approach, because someone needs to be absorbing the risk along this journey. And there needs to be that person that says, hey, look, I want you to go find opportunities and gaps, and I'm going to protect you and the team with my influence and my position. So with the authorities that I have available to me, I am accepting the risk of this. It's not you doing this, all these rat warrens and running around. This is actually me doing this. Um, and so I've put, put that onus of responsibility onto you and the team. So off you go, risk lies with me. And you'll be amazed at the moment you say to someone, the risk sits in my lap, not yours, how far people will go to support the plan. Um, you know, and I, 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 
nuanced a lot of the risks of an offensive strategy in um, into everything I just discussed. But I guess one of the key points um, about risk is the separation between um, the acceptance of the overarching strategy versus our personal biases. So there needs to be that discussion that says, as a team, we are going to be forward leaning. That will make some of you uncomfortable. Um, however, we're going to offset that by doing this, this, and this. These are really important discussions to have. Thanks, John. Yeah, Dave, that ex expectation management piece is is so important when we're looking at communicating with our teams. You know, there's that's why we plan. That's why we plan to plan. It's why we have a strategy in the first place. Because what we're looking at is, you know, giving people the framework and the boundaries to work outside of. It's like you know, you can't get people to think outside the box if you haven't articulated what that box is. You know, if you haven't given them the expectation, let them know the current scenario, let them know the triggers that we're looking at but to be able to transition because then Dave's right. They're just going to run off doing, doing God knows what. And as a leader, that's important in order to be able to deliver that in a way that's simple and effective. You know, you can just talk to your people and outline this stuff and they'll go with it. You know, you build that trust, you build that momentum and you build that open and open and honest communication and it will go leaps and bounds. So what's the point? You know, what are the, what are the considerations? Why, why bother with any of it? Um, you know, we, we, all, we have a term where, you know, you talk about planning, all right? The, the, just that simple fact of planning your strategy gives you an ability to, to lean forward or defend and delegate those um, authorities down so that people can make decisions in your absence. Okay, that's one of the important points here, having a strategy. Why we have a purpose, why we have a vision, why we have mission success criteria, because it allows us to delegate authorities for decision-making down. That's why we have a strategy. It allows us to move faster because decisions are made at the, at the coalface, at the very front of where you know, client meets, meets company person. That's why we have a strategy. That's why it's implemented. And that's why it's important to articulate those expectations to your team. The strategy also outlines where your available resources are going to be, are going to be given or be allocated. And it's important because like Dave was mentioning before, we have a finite amount of energy. We have a finite amount of cash flow. We have a finite amount of assets. So in that strategy and planning, we're identifying where we're going to allocate those resources for best effect. And if, again, we manage the expectations of our organization to say, hey, this amount of expenditure is going to occur. These teams are going to be built in order to gain that opportunity. These people are going to be tasked with defending in these in environments. We're going to mitigate risk. We're going to do that sort of thing. It means we can allocate our available resources for the most impact, which is important because like Dave was saying before, it's finite. Now, with the strategy and with the resources, the key piece, the key cog in this wheel is leadership. Because at the end of the day, your, one of your primary roles as a leader is to make decisions. Right? Now, I'm not just talking about your, your CEO types. We're talking about leadership at all levels. Right? We've come up with a strategy. We've, we've allocated the resources. So, you know, we've got the why and we're looking at the how. Now, we have to empower our people to make decisions all the way down the train or all the way down the chain. Chain, right that's the importance of leadership to make decisions you've given them the triggers which means they know when to pivot they know how much they can spend they know what assets they can use to to either find a gap or to defend or you know whatever the strategy at that time is but ne never underestimate the importance of making decisions as a leader and we need to empower our people to do that so what does that give us by delegating authorities and decision capabilities down to the lowest level it allows us to prosecute those opportunities. It allows us to find opportunities, whether we're in defense or whether we're in an offensive phase, it allows the leaders at the lowest level to then empower their teams to find those opportunities. It allows them to gain organizational buy-in, to use, a, a, again, a consultant wanky term, but it, it's true. To get your people on board means you're empowering them to make decisions. You're giving them a framework with which to operate so that they know their boundaries. They know the box to operate in. They can think outside of it as much as they want, but they know what opportunities are actually available for them to gain or for them to, to prosecute or for them to, 
understand or to look at or to gain more information on to then bring back to the leader to make a decision on it. And you know, that, that's the important part of why we have a strategy, why we outline the resources, why our leaders make are as important, they're empowered to make decisions so that they can find and gain those opportunities. Dave, do you have any points on that one, mate? I was gonna, I was gonna talk about the, the OODA loop, but I think we don't need to go into that. Nah. Um, yeah, look, I think you've covered it. I, one, of the, one of the things we just keep seeing over and over again, and I'm sure many people can relate, is organisations that get upset and frustrated with their team members for doing the wrong thing but we haven't actually ever bothered to explain to them what the right thing is. And I always think that the strategy is that right thing. You know, it's so, it sounds so simple and it almost sounds condescending when you say it, but, but it is this simple. Um, you know, we have a strategy for a reason and everything within the organization should subordinate under that. And it should be the reason we hire and fire people. It should be the reason we, um, choose certain um, initiatives over others. It should be the reason um, we've decided to accelerate our resources um, burn in order to achieve a certain result. Because we mapped this um, and we have an overall effect or intent that we want to achieve. And I, I feel that we spend so time doing, so much time doing things, um, but the things that we're doing aren't those things that actually provide impact and effect. And the strategy is that overarching point. But it needs to be themed. And in fact, I had a, um, a really good boss once that every single time we, we used to engage in a new activity, um, we would stop and she would say the key messaging for this activity is every single time without fail, the key messaging for this activity is this, this and this. And it links to our motto or our strategy of boom. And every single time, and like this, would, you know, we, we had just thrown an idea, written it up on a whiteboard, and already we had mapped the key message and the idea behind that initiative. And then all the move away and move toward people could scramble and start finding their piece in that puzzle very, very quickly. But we were also working to an agreed messaging construct. We actually knew what we were going to say to people about this before it even, before it even started planning. Um, that was very valuable and I saw the value in that time and time again. I think, yeah, that, I just put that on the back end of what you said, Jono. If you want to mate, that, mate, that alignment right, that you're talking about, their ability to talk to each other, the key messaging, getting everyone on song effectively is what separates average teams from high-performing teams. They're aligned. They're aligned in messaging, they're aligned in action and people can see it. Once you've been a part of a high performing team that has that alignment has that strategy and they're all orientated towards the same thing. They might be move away or move toward, but they're orientated towards the same goal. Once you see that in action, you understand how addictive it is. And you know, I, I, that's why we say, and why we're so passionate about strategy and organizations, because it gives you that alignment and it gives your people the opportunity to succeed. So which one? <laughs> I, we've kind of given up the clue, but the answer is it's it's one, it's the other, or it's it's all at once, um, and it's subjective and contextual to the environment. I'll give you a really good example. Let's use our own company as a case study. So we had a five-year plan. Uh, we we designed that a year and three months ago, and then Corona hit us. Okay, so we're in the same boat as everyone else. What we did, the first thing we did when that happened was Jono and I scrambled, realized that this corona thing is worldwide, it's going to completely change the environment. And we went back to our strategy and we said, do we actually need to change anything? You know, we might have to change the way we communicate some of the things. We might have to change slightly the mechanism that we deliver these services. But in reality, the strategy the strategy. At the moment, it's still a forward-leaning strategy. We like to get out as far and wide as possible. Um, we like creating the eighth mile community because we get to meet people like yourself and leverage off their skills and their corporate knowledge. Really nothing changed for us. You know, um, yes, we've got a burn in terms of some of the projects turned off, but 
you know, let's be honest, environmentally, some of the projects might have turned off anyway. Um, so in this way, it's just pressure testing the strategy we already had. For other organisations, very like-minded to us and, and similar in approach, all up until that point, we're very, very forward-leaning. But at, as soon as the, you know, the idea or the concept of the corona, um, the COVID-19 hit the world, they shelled up and then they hid. And whilst we were still moving forward and it kind of felt like a running race and everyone just kind of fell out behind us for a while while everyone was, you know, tying their shoe. And yes, we're at a level of risk and, you know, we talk about risk. We accepted a level of risk and we said, hey, look, we're going to continue to try and grow and expand whilst this is happening, but we're going to roll back the rate at which we do that. But thematically, we're still leaning towards a forward leaning strategy. We're still trying to find opportunities and gaps and we're still trying to grow our influence. We're not shelling up. We're not, you know, hiding We're um, we're not going defensive. We're still going offensive, but we're just winding back the acceleration a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I feel, you know, we might need to test and adjust that again, but our strategy is still, strong enough, I feel, for the circumstances we're in. Um, so I guess the, what I'm trying to say out of all this is the whole purpose of a strategy is you have a, a baseline, you have a cross-reference that you can mirror your decision-making off and go, mm, what has changed and what hasn't changed? You know, going back to Sam's point before about facts versus assumptions, you know, there's a list of a million assumptions right now across the world. Um, and the list of facts is small and few and far between. But the facts we do have suggest that we don't need to overcompensate or do a knee-jerk reaction. So that's why we need to understand the environment uh, and cross-reference off the offensive or defensive strategy. And in certain parts of our business, we've, you know, taken a more risk averse approach to certain aspects in terms of revenue um, and some of the sources of, um, you know, services that we subscribe to. Um, but in other areas, we've accelerated far quicker than anything else. And one of them is online training. Um, you know, we went very forward leaning very, very quickly. Um, and we all scrambled to get that up and running, but the strategy is no change really. Um, which brings to the next point triggers. In this context, when we say triggers, what we're talking about is the, um, the messaging from the leadership to the remainder of the organization to say, I'm going to keep moving this team forward in the same way, in the same approach, but I'm looking out for these particular triggers to influence a decision change on my end. So what that might look like is, you know, in our context, use the case study we just had, business is running along well. Um, you know, our projects have turned off largely, but our executive coaching has increased and uh, our online training package is, you know, getting ready for launch. So it's kind of plateauing or maybe it's a little bit slewed one way or the other. But a trigger might be if this executive coaching turns off and we lose our... Um, stream of renewable um, income and revenue, like our, our monthly recurring revenue, um, then we need to stop the marketing campaign accelerating at this rate on the other side. So the trigger for this influence the decision over here, but we need, we have a number, Jono and I have a number in our head about what that number is and what that effect is. And the moment we hit it, we'll have a conversation with the team and say, this is a deliberate choice to wind back this and accelerate this. Um, but we've already talked through it and we've cross-referenced it off the strategy um, and we're going to keep moving forward until we hit those triggers. Does that make sense? Have you got any points from anyone in the, in the audience there on, on triggers or what they've seen, what they've currently seen in, in the current environment? You know, we, Dave and I have spoken about this before, like we accelerated very quickly in our strategy um, initially like pushing forward with seminars and those sort of things and then you know COVID hit and some things slowed down but you know it's like watching Stephen Bradbury where you know these people like other 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 organizations were accelerating at, a, at an even more rapid rate you know their resource burn but then something hit the lead skater and they've all 
had their legs taken out for each other. Oh, sorry, taken out. And all of a sudden, you know, Bradbury skates through for the goal. Um, you know, we've made deliberate, <laughs> made deliberate decisions to wind back some resource burns in different places, but we haven't showed up completely. We still want to prosecute for that, for that line. Does anyone else have any, any examples of in the current environment, what they've seen in, in behaviours from other organisations or their own? Sorry, Dave, you're on mute, mate. Oh, Dave, can you unmute, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the trigger for us with this virus was it virtually made us jump towards online training. We've, we've been talking about it, um and ahhing. I really enjoyed delivering in the classroom um, and my bluff got called. Sorry, Dave, you're now going to deliver it online. Use Zoom. That's why I jumped on a couple of your actual webinars just so I could get a feel for it. And then I've already delivered three courses now, and it's it's working really well. And I see after the virus goes away and recover from all this, I can see us continuing to use online training as well as going in the classroom. So this online virus, or this virus, has actually given us um, a kick in the pants, so to speak, to actually keep up with the way the industry is going. And um, it's working really well. So, the, the, yes, the courses have dropped back, but the, with the online courses and the way we're doing them, they're actually picking up again exponentially. So that's what happened to us with the virus hitting. You, you might awesome, find too, Dave, that it might actually work out for the best because yep. your overheads are probably decreasing because you're running everything online now. You're not hiring rooms and travelling. and Exactly, and I'm not dropping. No, I was driving, I think um, last financial year, I drove 27,000 kilometres in my own private vehicle between the course all the way up to the Warrego Highway, out as far as Roma, and flights and accommodation up to Gladstone and Townsville and down the, down the uh, to Gold Coast to deliver this course. And uh, back then, Zoom wasn't around. And um, now it is, I can deliver, I had, Guys from Rome and the Gold Coast, sunny coast, attend my course on um, Wednesday online. So, yeah, the, the cost saving is great. Yeah. So and what, a, what an opportunity to, you know, record your sessions as well so that you can, you can scale, you can get people in to look at how you run a course. You, yeah. It builds your training capability. You don't have to have someone on site with you to mentor them. You go, hey, look, this is how we run. This is the process. This is how we train. And, you know, you can scale now because your overheads are, are less. It is. It is. Yeah, good on you, Dave. Perfect, yeah, perfect example. I guess one of the key points that um, we'd love to convey and from our own observations and our own experience, both getting it right and getting it wrong, um, is around the need for planning. But planning for the purpose of determining those triggers and those, um, I guess, considerations for how we're going to actually measure and adjust this plan. So, you know, many of you will attest, you come up with this great plan, um, you spend, you know, days, weeks, months coming up with it, and then you roll it out and then in a moment's notice it kind of all falls through and then it changes or whatever. But most of you would, if you think back, would probably attest to the energy and the detail that you went into planning. There were some key points that you managed to source from that, which allowed you to be um, looking for opportunities. Dave, your, your example just then is the perfect case study for it. You have a methodology, you have content, you have a delivery style. Suddenly there's a massive environmental change you know, everything gets twisted on its head, but then you found the things that were constants, the facts that we do know, the constants in that situation, you grabbed them, added some bolt-ons to the side, but your strategy is still the same. Yeah. You're still rolling out a product which is similar in nature. You're still engaging with people. You're still representing your brand well, and you're still scaling. Um, but you've done it in a completely different way. Had you not gone through all that rigmarole of the detail of planning to get postured for that, you would never have been able to capitalise on those opportunities, I would suggest. Exactly, yeah. All right, Johnny. 
just twist what you were saying there, most, much with the planning, but it also links to what you were saying about being aligned with the key messaging. And Jonathan referenced that when your, your teams align with the key messaging, that that's the best way for them to be a high performing team. Internally, it allows you to be a high performing team, but externally, the vision that people have of your business, if you're all singing the same message, is that you are credible, that you are competent, and that you are confident. And yep. if you are seeing those three C's, because you're all aligned, then you know half your job's done marketing-wise. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> because uh, you know people can see that positioning and uh, it lifts your profile. Yeah, great, great adding. Great adding. Thanks, Sam. And that is why, Sam, you can tell us how we do what we do. <laughs> we have no idea. No, just kidding. It's all part of the strategy. It's all part of the plan. Um, look, guys, uh, that's all the slides and all the, all the information that we wanted to push to you. But we still wanted to leave a little bit of time uh, for you to raise any points, raise any questions, or even your perspective on some of the things that are happening in the current environment, some of the things that are happening with your own organisations. I mean, we like to talk about you know, how people are pivoting. We love the, the, you know, how people have looked at the triggers, looked at the environments, done their analysis, and then gone, you know what, let's move. Let's, you know, because you know, we see a lot of people shelling up at the moment, but to see those organizations pivot and just, you know, crush through and keep going really, really excites us. We think it's great. Um, so if you've got any of those, feel free to chuck them in there. Any, any stories or any points? Yeah, for, for us, you know, I can't speak for all of the work. Like we're, pretty large organization, you know, almost 300,000 employees. So we have a little bit of a buffer here. <laughs> um, but but <laughs> my purpose and where I am in the, in the organization, what's been great for us actually is we've been able to sort of internalize a little more and focus on, you know, growing our community um, as well as kind of growing our, our brand within the organization. Um, so we've been able to really pivot and it's really amazing how really in the past three weeks, we've just come together really, really well and really close. Um, so we're excited, you know, once we get out of this and we are able to start really branching out to see what happens with our clients, um, you know, all the new value that we're gonna bring and all the, all the new ideas that we're passing upwards to, through the organization. That, that's a really great point, Ryan, that you guys have done that because what, what we're finding in you know, still engaging with our clients and in those discussions that we're having is what, people didn't have or didn't perceive that they had before it was time. You know, it's almost like the uh, COVID is giving people back time, right? Now they're looking at those projects that they put on the shelf. They're looking at the strategy that was underdeveloped. You know, they're starting to go back and relook at their organizational values and whether that fits back with the organization. Now they're starting to do a lot of that planning. You know, we say the, uh, in a project sense, one of the biggest enemies to projects is business as usual which is, it's really weird to, it's really weird to say. And, you know, sometimes we get external agencies in to build a project and build a pipe so that then it can hand over to the BAU staff at some stage. But now those BAU staff are being involved in the planning. They're being involved in the strategy. They're being involved in the values um, uh, development programs and all that. And people are starting to get a bit more involved, which is weird because we don't have that physical closeness but everyone's still able to get involved and put their two cents in and you're actually starting to see some really well developed projects plans strategies which usually would have been outsourced to another organization to do um, it's been a really great um, and it's been really good to see from a lot of organizations from, from our perspective i do also see that as a cost saving as well not bringing those external agencies in and supporting their actual employees actually being part of the planning and uh, process and there's that there's that other thing that people put to the side um professional development of your people yeah. there's now no there's now no excuse you've got time you could you could put your people you can put your staff on webinars you can invest in professional training courses those sort of things because everything everyone's put it all online they don't have to fly away to melbourne sydney over to the us to do these uh to do these courses they could do it at home they can do more of it because the overheads of travel and commute have been taken away as well. You know, you, there's opportunities and all that, which um, we're starting to see, which is again, great. Yeah, yeah I'm interested to see the innovation that comes out of this. Yeah. To be honest, like all the ideation that's able to occur. Um, it's yep. gonna be really exciting. Um, yep. 
and you can't unlearn it, Brian. You can't yeah. unlearn these lessons. Yeah. No, this is, you guys are really sparking a lot. Um, a lot of this kind of ties into what I've been, what I've been doing. So I, I really appreciate you letting me join um, and hear this. Oh, mate, the pleasure's ours. And, you know, I'm kind of glad this ended up being a bit of a small group chat. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, hey, look, from our team to you, uh, look, we, we don't take um, the support that we get um, for granted. And we're very, very big fans of each and every one of you. And, um, you know, I, I always try and think with Jono about how we can actually provide more value and, you know, what things have we learned and, you know, how do we stop people recreating our own mistakes in the past? Because there's probably a list larger than the ones we got right. <laughs> and, you know, you know, your support is amazing in all of this. We learn as much, if not more, from everyone else.